It's time for our worship to begin. I'd like to encourage you to come in and find a seat. We're glad that you're here. Very special welcome to any guests that we have in our assembly today. As we focus our thoughts on our God this morning as we prepare to worship, we'll read from Psalm 27, beginning in verse 4. One thing I have asked from the Lord, that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. There were 733 for those following the book. We praise thee, O God, our Redeemer.
Pray with me, please. Most gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, our Creator and our Redeemer, the one true and living God, the one Creator, all things are created by you. Dear Lord, it's such a blessing that we can come and praise your name and we can study your word. We pray that we, have, that we worship and study you in our, with love in our hearts and, and enthusiasm. And we pray that it's acceptable in your sight. Dear Lord, we're so grateful for the church here. We're grateful for Brown Trail and what she stands for and that we, she spreads your word as it's taught to us and as we study. Please be with the elders, these wonderful men. Give them the wisdom that they need to lead us. We pray that we are good Christians and that we study and adjust our lives to your word so we can lead others to you. Dear Lord, please be with the deacons and the ministers and our teachers. And we pray that they serve in accordance to your word as they, as they serve as special servants do and lead others to you. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for Eddie Parrish and his ability to, to preach the word to us. And please be with him today as he does, as he preaches our lesson. And we pray that we study it and we adjust our lives accordingly so we can be better Christians and lead others to you. Dear Lord, there are many of our congregation that are sick and undergoing treatment. We pray that they draw their encouragement and their strength from you. Please be with those that are, that are treating them to guide them and give them, give them, restore them back to their health. Dear Lord, there are also families that have lost loved ones recently. Please strengthen them, give them the comfort that only you can give. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for Jesus Christ and we're thankful for his life and his example and especially his death and resurrection for us, that he took our place on the cross so we can have the forgiveness of our sins. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. Seven thirty-eight. We will glorify. <clears throat> we will. take the Lord's Supper.
If you'd like to follow along with the scripture reading before the Lord's Supper this morning, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. That's Luke 22, 14 through 20. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Heavenly Father, as we partake of this bread, we remember the flesh that was torn by the terrible beatings of your son, of the flesh that was torn by the spikes driven through his hands and feet. We know that this was instituted for our behalf because of our failures of memory that we should observe it each Lord's Day, each first day of the week. At this time, please bless this bread and those that partake is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today on the webcast of our worship assembly. If you're unfamiliar with worship assemblies and churches of Christ, allow me to explain what we're doing. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by Judas and turned over to his enemies to be crucified, the Lord gathered with his apostles to observe the Jewish Passover. At that gathering, he inaugurated a new practice to be observed in the church after his resurrection and ascension back to heaven. This memorial involves eating and drinking items that symbolize his body and blood. Listen to Matthew's account of this event. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. Then in the next verse, Matthew 26, 29, Jesus informed the disciples that they would not observe this memorial again until the kingdom was established. And when the kingdom, also called the church, came into existence, the disciples began to observe this memorial regularly. Acts 2, 42. How regularly? Acts 20 verse 7 reveals that on the first day of the week. It's our desire to follow the example of the New Testament church in all essential matters. That's why we do as they did and observe this memorial to Jesus every first day of the week.
Our Father, as we continue this memorial, we are so thankful for the love that you have for us and that you allowed your son Jesus to die such a cruel and painful death for us, for our sins, for the hope that we have through that of eternal life in heaven with you if we live according to your will. Be with each one of us now as we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that Jesus shed on that cross, that each one of us will focus our thoughts on the events of that day and partake in a manner humble and respectful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. According to the New Testament, the weekly observance of the Lord's Supper involves more than remembering Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us, though that is the primary emphasis. The Lord's Supper also affords time for personal examination. Listen to Paul and his inspired teaching to the church in Corinth. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 26 through 28. As the church continues this memorial observance today, we're not only thinking about what Jesus did for us on the cross, we're also thinking about ourselves. We're looking deep within our hearts and examining our actions to see if our lives have been a proper reflection of our gratitude for what Jesus did for us. So this is a valuable time each week for the Christian. We gratefully remember Jesus and we humbly examine ourselves. Four hundred forty four.
Let's pray. Our kind Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the privilege of coming before your throne and coming before your throne boldly. We're grateful, Father, for the incredible sacrifice of your Son that makes this possible. We pray, Father, at this time as we, as we collect funds that you may bless us and that we may give cheerfully and that these funds would be used exactly how you would have us to use them. Grant us wisdom, Father, and help us to do your blessed will. May you be with us and bless, bless us at this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul gave the following instructions to the church in the city of Corinth. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. For a congregation to carry out its necessary work, it must have operating funds. The passage we just read serves as our example for gathering Brown Trail's monetary resources. It's a simple free will offering. If you ever visit with us on a Sunday, we will collect an offering, but our guests are never obligated or pressured to give. The passing of collection trays is just an expedient way for us to fulfill God's desire that our members support the church's work. I love the Six hundred seventy four will be the song of invitation. Will you turn with me in your New Testaments to Matthew, the twenty third chapter? Matthew, the twenty third chapter, we begin reading in verse twenty nine, where our Lord is pronouncing woe to the scribes and Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn 
the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpent's blood of vipers. How can you escape the condemnation of hell? Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that you may come all the, sorry, that you may come, that on you may come the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who sent to hear to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. A glass will only hold so much. If you start filling a glass with water, eventually, if you don't stop, the glass is going to be full. Nothing else will go into it until some kind of room is made. It will either overflow as you try to get more into it, or the water must be purposely poured out to create more room. And that's a very simple illustration. We get that, don't we? We've done that. We've seen that. But it's interesting that in Scripture... This very illustration is often used to describe the wrath of God. We are continuing today our journey this year through a study of Bible words. I hope that you've been continuing to read in the devotional book, reading the passages that go along with this study throughout the week. And uh, if you've been doing that, you'll recognize that this was last week's word, Uh, but uh, we're going to look at this week's word tonight, if the Lord wills, and we assemble again at five, we'll look at the word grace. But I mentioned at the beginning of the year that we would not always each week cover the words, but we will... Uh, cover them as best we can in the course of time. And so we're going to look at this word today, and as we do, I want for our thoughts to be guided by some of the harshest, sternest words that Jesus ever spoke. And they're words that come from our text that John read just a moment ago. At the end of Matthew chapter 23, which is the end of a very lengthy denunciation of the religious leaders 
of God's people in the first century, the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocritical scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus had some of his sternest words that he ever spoke reserved for those people. But we would put our souls in jeopardy if we don't learn some lessons from what he originally spoke to them. Lessons about the wrath of God. I'd like for you to consider these lessons this morning. And the first one is this. God's wrath is often stored up. God's wrath is often stored up. There have been times, as you read through Scripture, you'll come across these instances where God dealt with sinful people in a more immediate fashion. A couple of examples quickly. Nadab and Abihu probably have to be near the top of that list if we think about God expressing wrath in an instantaneous fashion. The two sons of Aaron who took incense and offered it on an altar to God, but it was not what God had authorized them to do. And in Leviticus 10, 1 to 3, the Bible says that immediately fire came down from heaven and devoured those boys on the spot. Instant wrath. Or you might think of a New Testament example, Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, who brought an offering to the apostles to be used in the ongoing work of the church. But they lied about it. They lied about the amount. They lied, they lied about how much they were actually giving based upon what they said they had sold a piece of property for and all that. They lied. And they died instantly. Ananias first, Sapphira comes in, confirms the lie, and she died. So there were occasions when God did that. But those were rare occasions. Those are the exception to the rule. It is generally the case, it is most often the case that God does not dispense wrath that way. He stores it up. The Bible uses that language. Can you imagine what, what the skies would look like if God rained fire from heaven down on every person every time some sin was committed? No, sometimes, oftentimes, God's wrath is stored. And He does that to allow people time and opportunity to repent, to turn away from their sins and turn to Him for forgiveness and pardon. God is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And in verse 15 of that same chapter, Peter says, so we ought to consider then the patience of God as salvation, in the sense that when God is patient with us, He is giving us the opportunity for us to deal properly with our transgressions and have them forgiven. He stores up his wrath. But if we choose to use that time that God offers us, his patience, if we use that time instead of to turn to him and, and come to him penitently and receive the salvation that he offers in Christ, if instead of using our time for that, instead we just continue to live in sin, those sins accumulate. They, they build up. And so you have language in Scripture that indicate this concept of sins filling up some kind of container, figurative container. And this is what Jesus had in mind in Matthew 23 in our text in verse 32 when he said to these hypocritical 
Jewish leaders, he said, fill up then the guilt of your father's sins. Go ahead, fill it up. What did he have in mind? Well, he had in mind his own death as the culminating act of sin of those people. They were going to fill up the measure of their sins by putting him to death and also their persecution of the early church. The sins were accumulating. You find that language elsewhere in Scripture. Genesis chapter 15, verse 16. When God is speaking to Abraham, and he's promising Abraham that he's going to one day, his descendants are one day going to possess the land that Abraham was living in, sojourning in, the land of Canaan. But God tells Abraham in that text, Genesis 15, that before that happens, his descendants are going to spend 400 years in another land as servants in bondage. He's talking about Egypt. And he said that after that 400-year period in Egypt, God's going to lead them out and then bring them to possess Canaan. Why the 400 years? Why not just give it to them then? God answers that, Genesis 15, verse 16, when he says, it's because the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. In other words, the sins of the Amorites, which was a, a... representation of all of the Canaanite people. The sins of those Canaanite people had not reached the point at which it would have been just for God to at that point remove them from the land. It would take that long for them to accumulate sin and fill up their measure of sin before God could then say, okay, now it's time as punishment for their sins to move them out and then I'll move my people in. The iniquity of the Amorite was not yet full. It was being stored. Or you might consider 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 16, where Paul references hostile Jewish people who were persecuting early Christians, and he says concerning them, they are filling up the measure of their sins. Now here's the important point for our purposes today. As sins accumulate and fill up. Correspondingly, so does the wrath of God. God's wrath in response to those unpunished sins also builds up. Right after Paul said regarding those, that hostile Jewish element persecuting Christians, that they were filling up the measure of their sins, in the very next breath, or the very next line of ink, Paul says, but wrath has come upon them to the utmost. They're filling up sin, God's filling up wrath. In Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, key text on this principle. Paul addresses hypocritical, stubborn, unrepentant Jewish Christians. And he says, you unrepentant, stubborn, hypocritical folk, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. As long as you remain stubborn, as long as you remain impenitent, as long as you live lives of hypocrisy, you are storing up for yourselves wrath that will be poured out on you in the day of wrath and the day of the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. God's wrath is often stored up. But what happens when God gets his bucket full? What happens when it's full? God's wrath will be poured out. Notice the pouring out language of Scripture. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 8. As 
God is addressing the city of Jerusalem prior to the Babylonian destruction of that city. Now, the captivity, the Babylonian captivity had already begun. It it had begun in 606 B.C., but the temple was not finally destroyed until 586. And between the time of the beginning of the captivity, which Ezekiel was a part of that, and the destruction of the city, God gave some prophetic words to Ezekiel the prophet that he passed along to the people regarding the fate of the city of Jerusalem. This is one of those instances. Ezekiel 7 verse 8, where God says regarding the city, I will shortly pour out my wrath on you. Same book, Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 8. Ezekiel sees a vision of this coming destruction on the city. And as he's seeing this vision, he cries out, Ezekiel 9 verse 8, As they were striking the people, and I alone was left, I fell on my face and cried out, saying, Alas, Lord God, are you destroying the whole remnant of Israel by pouring out your wrath on Jerusalem? Again, the point, just notice the language. Pouring out. And then you get to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 16, and one of the many visions revealed to John, he sees seven angels who are holding seven bowls described as being bowls full of the wrath of God. And in that vision, those angels are told, pour it out on everything. The righteous judgment of God against those who were persecuting his people. Now you put all these passages together, the imagery is very easy to see. Sinful people, instead of using God's patience as an opportunity to turn to God in penitence, use it instead to fill up their buckets of sin. All the while, God is filling up his bowls of wrath, if you will, And will continue to do so until the point that they can hold no more and must be emptied. Now back to Matthew 23. Jesus said to the people, go ahead, fill up the measure of your father's sins. But the bowls are going to be poured out. God's wrath is going to be poured out and did be, and it was poured out on the city of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. In the generation that heard Jesus announce that coming judgment. Look at verses 34 to 36 of Matthew 23. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you'll kill and crucify. Some of them you'll scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Notice it, 35. So that upon you may fall. The guilt of all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. The generation that heard Jesus pronounce those words were about to fill up the measure of God's wrath on those people by finally putting his own son to death. Just like their ancestors had done in persecuting God's prophets historically. We'll say something about their attitude toward that in a moment. These people were about to commit the utmost sin by putting the very Son of God to death. And in doing that, and in persecuting God's people going forward, they were going to be filling up what was lacking in the sinfulness of their fathers until God would finally say, the time has come. Your house is left unto you desolate, verse 38. God's going to pour out his wrath. But an interesting thing in that whole concept of sins filling up, of God's wrath filling up, and ultimately being poured out, Do you find it interesting 
that many times the recipients of God's wrath rarely think they deserve to be recipients of it. Go back to Matthew 23 and look at the people to whom Jesus was speaking and how they would not open their own eyes to their own guilt. Back up to verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Think about that. They couldn't deny what their ancestors had done to the prophets that had preceded them. They couldn't deny what, they, what, what their own people had done to men like Jeremiah and Amos and others of the prophets that tried to get God's people to turn around and they were met only with persecution. They couldn't deny the history and so they would look back and say, well, you know what, if we had lived back then, ah, we, we wouldn't have treated those prophets that way. And so they would, they would adorn the monuments to the prophets and, and, and build these elaborate tombs and things like that to, to honor these prophets of God. And, and they were fond of saying, you know, we'll treat them this way. We'll, we'll, we'll honor them in, in all of these ways. And if we had lived back then, we would have done the same thing. We wouldn't have acted like our ancestors. Jesus said, you are very much the sons of your fathers. Go ahead. Fill up the measure of your father's sins. While they stood back and with arrogance said, we wouldn't have treated Jeremiah the way they treated Jeremiah. We wouldn't have treated Amos the prophet the way they treated Amos the prophet. All the while they made those claims, they were in the process of trying to find a way that they could take Jesus, the very Son of God Himself, and have Him killed. That's why Jesus said, you don't even see your own hypocrisy. You're doing worse than what your ancestors ever thought about doing. So fill up the measure of your father's sins. When it comes to that final day, and all of us stand before God to be judged, there are going to be people on that day who will be sentenced to suffer the wrath of God eternally who will not believe that they deserve that sentence. Remember Matthew 7? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, <laughs> didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do many wonderful works in your name? What, what do you mean, depart from me? Remember Matthew 25, verse 44? Wait, wait, Lord, when did we see you hungry and not feed you? When did we see you thirsty and not give you something? When did we see you in prison or without? Co when did we see you and. This is all the more reason for us to live in a consistent state of personal evaluation, keeping our hearts attuned to the Word of God, allowing it to guide our choices and mold our character that we not fall into the same type of hypocrisy that characterized so many before. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful or wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The beautiful prayer of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. But there's good news. The good news is, God does not want you to be the recipient of His wrath. Yes, it's being stored up. Yes, there's coming a day when it will be poured out. But God does not want you to be the recipient of that. That's why Jesus left heaven.
and became one of us and suffered the wrath of God on our behalf. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. Not a word that we use a lot, but in, in a very real sense, propitiation is the idea of a substitutionary wrath absorber. Jesus stood under God's bowl of wrath. A bowl filled because of the sins of mankind and God poured it out on him to allow us to escape that same wrath. God commends or demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. That's the good news. Because Jesus endured the wrath of God, we may avoid the wrath of God. So the last question, the remaining question for us, is what does your glass look like today? When it comes to the wrath of God, as it pertains to you, is your glass today empty because you are in Christ? Because you have trusted in Jesus for your salvation? Is it because you're maintaining your relationship with Jesus so that His blood covers you? And you don't live in fear of the wrath of God because Jesus took that penalty for you and you have accepted what He's offered you? Through your embracing of Him, your embracing of His will, your commitment to Him lived out in your life from day to day? Is God's glass of wrath empty as it pertains to you? Or is it nearing its brim? Because instead of using all of this time and opportunity that God has blessed you with to turn to Jesus, you've been using it to just stack up more sins. Never forget, as you continue to stack up the sins, God's wrath continues to build as well. His righteous judgment. Why not accept what Jesus has done for you? Why not accept the fact that He took God's wrath for you so that you don't have to face it? But you've got to turn your life over to Him if you want that blessing. You've got to trust Him. You've got to stop trusting yourself. You've got to stop living any way you want to live and recognize that a commitment to Jesus is the only way for you to avoid God's wrath when He pours it out once and for all on that last day. Do you need to come to Jesus? Do you need to trust Him? Turn from your sins in penitence, confess Him, be immersed in water where you will come into contact with His saving blood that will wash your sins away and empty that glass. If you need to do that, do not delay another moment. 
Because today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. If you need to respond, you have an opportunity now. Let us stand and sing together. Good morning. Welcome. I'd like to welcome our members as well as any visitors and encourage all of us to find someone we don't recognize or haven't spoken to in a while at the end of services and let's say hi to them, make them feel welcome this morning. I've got a few announcements, uh, one update from the prayer list. It's not all of them. The rest of the announcements are contained in the bulletin that are on the polls as you leave the uh, main area here. Uh, prayer list update. Margie Myrick, the mother of Grace Anderson, had been in a Medical City North Hills Hospital with pneumonia and got news that she went home yesterday afternoon. And on the news, there will be a brief budget presentation following our worship services this morning. And I'd like to point out to everybody, it did say brief. And that'll be after the last prayer in just a few minutes. The morning coffee crew will not meet tomorrow. The 50 plus fellowship this Tuesday is this Tuesday. Bring your own brown bag lunch and drinks and desserts will be provided. The Wednesday night ladies class will begin a study of the Sermon on the Mount uh, this Wednesday and Leah Hamrick will be teaching that class. There will be a youth devo next Sunday night at Blake and Patty Allen's house. That's next Sunday night. Lads to leaders and the T3 registration deadlines are both today. Let John Warrens know by tonight if you want to participate in these events. Again, that's lads to leaders, and the T3 regist excuse me, registration is today. Today is the deadline to sign up for next Sunday's Somebody Loves You Luncheon. Both guests and helpers need to sign up at the Info Center so we can have a head count for the food. And that's all I have. Let's go ahead and stand for this song, remain standing for the prayer, and please remember after the end of the prayer to be seated again before the presentation. Number 755.
Dear most righteous Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day that we can come and we can worship you and that we can partake of the Lord's Supper and to remember the sacrifice that your son made on that, that cruel and that ugly cross. Lord, we're thankful for Eddie and for the, bless, the lesson that has been delivered to us. And Lord, may we go forth this week and to reflect on it and apply it to our lives. Lord, we ask you to forgive us each of our sins as we repent that your wrath may not be stored up against us individually or, or against our families, but, Lord, that you might forgive us and not remember our sin anymore. Lord, watch over us. We go on into the world this, this week and keep us safe from the fiery darts of the evil one. And this is our prayer in your Son's most holy name. Amen. If you'd uh, be seated for just a moment, we'll uh, run through the budget presentations that the elders asked me to, to do, as we typically do this time of year. So we'll go through uh, 2018 uh, information real quick, and then I'll talk about the 2019 budget. So our weekly contributions for 2018, uh, the budget was 13425 our actual uh, contributions for 2018 ended up being 13709. Uh, we ended the year with a general fund balance of about 37 and which is which is good. Uh, that compared to 26,000 at the end of last year. Uh, that was helped by the fact there were 53 uh, weekly deposits in 2018, just based on the way the calendar fell. But it also means that uh, the amount we spent and the amount we came in were about the same, which is which is a good thing. For next year, 